tell him I'm not strong. He says I am. I tell him I can't go on. He says I can. And I've not loved everyone and not always overcome. But he has. Yeah. Father has a great big family, and there are many children besides me. If you're wondering how he divides his time, just let me say I never stand in
The news came to Egypt, the death angels come and get your house in order, prepare for that moment. A young boy is crying, cause he's scared of dying, but with morning's light, he finds it's all right. Because of the blood placed over the door, my sin debt is paid, I'm not afraid anymore. The Lamb has been slain, and now I am free. The sentence of death has passed over me, I now live in His love. Because of the blood, the preacher was preaching, judgment is coming, you better be ready and heed the warning. I too was crying, I knew I was dying, forgive me, I prayed, and now I am saved. Because of the blood placed over the door, my sin debt is paid, I'm not afraid anymore. The Lamb has been slain, and I am set free. The sentence of death has passed over me. I now live in His love. Because of the blood, I was locked in chains that had me bound till He came and rescued me. He opened up my blinded eyes, and now I can see. Because of the blood placed over the door, my sin debt is paid, I'm not afraid anymore. The Lamb has been slain, and now I am free. The sentence of death has passed over me, I now live in His love. Because of the blood, I now live in His love. Because of the blood. God, I do appreciate you being uh, faithful this morning to be in the Lord's house. I want to thank you for those that came out to our revival meeting, and uh, we've had a, we had a great meeting We're talking this morning about about the meeting, and I uh, we didn't have anyone. Uh, saved as far as we know as far as come the Lord but I believe our church was encouraged and I believe God's people were helped and so <clears throat> I just praise the Lord for what he done in the service but today's a new day and I believe that God's got a direction for our service this morning I believe there's uh, something that God wants to do in the service this morning and I trust that the Lord will do in your hearts what he so desires today fellas if you'll give me just a little bit more uh, volume I'd appreciate <clears throat> I'd appreciate that Exodus chapter number 12 we're going to read quite a few verses this morning and then we will make our prayer. I've enjoyed being in church so far. I've enjoyed being in the Lord's house today. Uh, you as uh, interactive in our worship and our song service. Uh, let's make sure we don't fall asleep, go somewhere else during our preaching service. <clears throat> the Bible said, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, and lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next uh, unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take with the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, with the pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire, and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. 
For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses whereof ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. I'm going to ask Dad to lead us as we pray this morning. <clears throat> yes, God, thank you for letting us to be here. Please, please, please have your way this morning. Yes, God, please help. Please help us to know you. Amen. Thank you for standing this morning. You can be seated. <clears throat> a very familiar passage of Scripture. I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that fact. And as I was, uh, I don't remember if I was riding down the road this week or what it was. I don't remember if I was listening to a song or what, it, what, it, what particularly led me to this passage. But I began to, to read. I began to, to look over this and, and think about some things. And, and you know, by the way, that's a good thing to do if we get... Uh, to where we can begin to think about the scriptures, scriptures that we've heard. And uh, I'm grateful that every now and again, God will bring things to our mind. It's just a reminder, uh, scriptures that we've heard. That's why, by the way, it's so, it's so important uh, that we're in the house of God, in the Word of God, reading and praying and studying, because God uses the scriptures in our life. And it's not just during the 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock now service, it's not just that, but God uses His Word to speak to the hearts of His people. <clears throat> but I begin to think as I was mulling over this, I was reading over this, and, and I begin to think about, uh, about even this morning this. You know, there's all kind of influences in this world. And, and by the way, this world is influencing every single day, and they're doing it on purpose. Uh, this, is, this is a little, I'm going to run a, a little rabbit, but we'll kill him and get back on track here in just a minute. But we uh, had Chloe and Hunter at the house, and you know, they, uh, they like to... Of course, they'll, they'll pile up in my room. I got run out. That's okay. And uh, they wanted to watch a movie. They wanted to watch a movie. And so uh, Chloe picked a movie, and we, we were laying there watching it before I got run out, and we was watching the movie. And uh, the subtle messages in those movies, you think our kids aren't being influenced. Listen, you're very naive. Everything they turn on, everything, it's with purpose, and it's with agenda. Now, I'm not telling you to chunk everything, but I am telling you, you better raise your kids or somebody else will. You better raise your children or somebody else will. And you say, preacher, I don't like society. Then you better get involved because they're the ones that's trying to raise your children. But I say all that to say this. Influences are everywhere. There's good influences. There's bad influence. Isn't it, isn't it amazing in a school system that you can have a teacher that's a great influence and you can have a teacher that you warn your children about and say, you don't pay attention to what they're having to say as far as their, their philosophies, their worldviews. And you try to help them and straighten them out. You see, influences are everywhere and influences are vital. Think about this this morning. How many people can say, somebody has influenced my life? Well, I can. Some, most of you can probably go to the people that have influenced your life. Uh, your mind can go back to that of a, of a coach or to that of a teacher or to that of a Sunday school teacher, whatever it may be. And you say, preacher, I have been Influence. Well, it's with that thought that I want to look to this portion of Scripture and I want to preach on a simple thought this morning. What a difference Dad can make. What a difference Dad can make. I'm grateful that I have the Dad that I have. I'm grateful that I have the Mom that I have. But I, but I, think, about the, uh, I think about the influence in my life. Now, they're not your Mom and Dad. I have kids. You're not their Mom and Dad. And you have children, and I'm not their dad. Okay, let's get that straight. All right, influences. Influences. Man, i got to get out of this introduction and get to preaching. But influences are so very vital when it comes to our life. And I think one of the greatest influences that we have is that of being a dad. Now, not everybody in here has a dad or still has a dad, and not everybody in here is... A dad as of yet, but I'm telling you something, fellas, that's probably the direction that you're heading if Jesus doesn't come. Now, now you say, well, why would you say this? Because I think it's high time that people, not just who 
have a dad, or not people that are going to be a dad, but people even that are dads, to understand how vital of a role of influence that we can have in someone's life. I, I'm going to give you this. I'm going I'm to throw this out there before I forget it. And I don't, this, this isn't even, even in my notes. But have you, ever thought, have you ever thought about the firstborn? You ever thought about that firstborn in this passage we'll talk about? You know, the firstborn, they may have already had their own children. They may have already been grown. They may have already had, you say, what are you saying? I'm telling you, it's never too late to decide that I'm going to make a positive influence in my children's life. It's never too late. You say, well, preacher, you don't understand. My children are grown. Hey, then show them, hey, that God has done something in your life and you're serious about serving the Lord and you're serious about walking with the Lord. You may not be able to undo the past 20 or 30 years. Hey, but you can change the 20 or 30 in the future. Influences are everywhere. Man, what a difference dad can make. I want to show you three or four things this morning. We're going to go to the house. I'm going to try, try to be mindful of the time. Barker told me every night, he said, so preacher, I, I preach too long. I preach too long. I liked it because that just makes everything easier for me. Now, let me say this. First of all, I want us to look at the responsibility that a dad has. One of the greatest responsibilities I think ever in my life was that of being a dad. Uh, for, for those of you that, that, that know us, I started very, very young. Very, very young. Uh, as a matter of fact, my biggest decision was which pair of basketball shoes was I going to wear up to that point. You know, was I going to ride four-wheelers a day or was I going to play basketball or were we going to have a combination of both? Picking out my wardrobe was pretty easy. You can talk to Libby about that one. But up to that point, Brother Denny, I had no idea the responsibility of a dad. None. I never even thought about it. I sure didn't appreciate my dad and the sacrifice he made. But Brother Brent, I'll never forget when she gave birth to Corey. I'll never forget as a very, very, very young man when that doctor looked at me, and, they, and by the way, I didn't have any siblings, I didn't have any cousins, I didn't have any little brothers. I mean, I'd held a few. But man, when they laid Corey in my arms, I don't pass out, and I don't get flushed, and I'm not weak stomach. But I'm telling you, Brother Terry, I was hot from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet because it dawned on me, I have to raise this child. I have to pay for this child, I have to make sure that I don't allow something to happen and I kill my kid. I've got to make sure I don't do that. And the responsibility of fatherhood come on me just like that. Now I've not always been what I should be and I've not always been what I wish I was and now that I'm older I look back and I wish I would have done some things differently. But the responsibility that weighs upon the shoulders of a dad to a man is incomparable. Is incomparable. And I'm not saying, you say, preacher, I'm here, and I'm not a dad. I'm not saying that you're less responsible. I'm not saying that you, your, your life matters less. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm telling you, a father, has a dad, has a responsibility that has been given to him. Now, I want you to look into the context of this story. This is the Passover. This is the first Passover. When God speaks to the hearts of Moses and Aaron, and God speaks to the people of the children of Israel, I want you to understand something. They are in Egypt this is a serious time. Maybe one of the most pivotal, crucial times in the nation, in the history of the people of God. They're down here in Egypt. They're down here in Egypt. And the Bible said, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year unto you. Now listen to the responsibility. Can I say first of all that the man is to be the head of the home? He's to be the head of the home. Now I want to read this verse and I'm going to make a comment. He said, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, they shall take unto them, what's that, what's that phrase say? Every man a lamb. Every man a a lamp. We are raising a bunch of soft, spineless men in our society. They're scared. They're afraid. Now listen, I'm not saying that dads don't have afraid, but somebody has to step up and kill that spider. You say, preacher, why would you laugh about that? Because I'm telling you right now, if our society, we're losing the men. They are trying to do everything they can to feminize the male role in our country. 
And what that does is that moves responsibility, that moves a God-given responsibility off of the authority of the man because it's all about a failure to comply to God's authority. You might, you, listen, they, our society does not want any authority because ultimately if they reject authority, it's, a, it's an outward display that they reject the authority of God. If you re- reject the authority of, of man, you re- reject the authority of law enforcement, you re- re- reject the authority of government, you will reject the same authority when it comes to God because nobody can tell me what to do. But I want you to understand something. Listen, that man is God set up as the head of of the home. That's not to be little ladies. I don't know, I don't know of a husband one that would in his right mind say, I don't need her. Because let me tell you something, you're young and gets hurt, they probably don't want you fellas, they want mom. They want mom, they want mom. Why? Mom may coddle them a little bit. Now maybe not, but I, but I can tell you this, most fathers are more of a rub some dirt on it and get back in there type mentality. But mom's not so much. You see, ladies are more gentle. Ladies are more emotional. Ladies are more compassionate for the most part. So I don't know if a man, I can promise you this, my kids wouldn't have made it without her. I can promise you that. They would not have made it without her. So, but I'm telling you, I'm, it's not to belittle the role of a wife, the role of a mother, but I'm telling you, men, it's time that you and I acknowledge our responsibility as the head of the home. And I'm not just talking about winning the bread. I'm not just talking about making sure, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make the money and she can raise the babies. You better get out of the sand and you better understand it's your responsibility to take care of the spiritual matters in your home. It is a man's responsibility to lead and to guide his family in spiritual matters. Have you ever noticed the majority of the time in the Bible, it's the men that lead and it's the ladies that follow? That's not by coincidence. It's not by coincidence. Well, I'm going to just let my wife make decisions. She she probably knows what better. Maybe you ought to spend a little more time walking with the Lord so you can know how to lead your family. Say, preacher, it's supposed to be a warm and fuzzy day. You're supposed to make us feel better about being dads. Let me tell you something. If you'll do it God's way, you can feel better about being a dad. And the head of the home. He said, every man a lamb. Now, I will say this. Some believe that this command was given to the leaders of each tribe or to the tribal divisions. Because over in verse number 21, he mentions that he called the elders. Now, I'm not saying that that's not the case, but I know this. Uh, it, that order was carried out not by the elders in each individual house, but it was carried out by the head of the home because there was a lot of doors in that land. Now, think about it with me, if you would. Let's think about the tears of it. Uh, uh, Moses and Aaron may have come around and said, Hey, I need to get everybody together. You're responsible for these people. I'm going to tell you. Now, you go tell them. But when it come down to the nitty-gritty of it, they as individuals had to respond. Let me tell you, God may uh, have written His Word years ago and given it through a few uh, human authors through the inspiration of the Spirit of God. A preacher may stand and say of a congregation that God has has called him to be the under-shepherd of to do this, but when it comes down to being the head of your home and to directing your family, the responsibility, men, falls on you and on you alone. On you and on you alone. It's time for Dad to be the head of the house. Not just for the money and the work, but in spiritual matters. You know, you know what I found out the older I get? All those things, those goodies, those toys that we live for, all that stuff rusts. All, those, all that stuff dilapidates. But if you'll leave a spiritual heritage with your children and enable them to walk with the Lord, enable them to serve the Lord, uh, listen, uh, there's no greater joy than to hear that my children walk with the Lord. We understand the context that he's talking about believers in the church that he's won to Christ. But I'm telling you, as a parent, man, one of the greatest accomplishments you ever have as a dad, as a mom, as a grandparent is what? Is that your children walk with God. Can I ask you an honest question, parents? This, I'm going to ask you a question. I want an answer. Raise your hand. How many of you love your children less because they drive a cheap, beat-up car? Does anybody in here care? I mean, you want your kids to be in something safe so that your grandbabies ain't broke down alongside the road. You can say amen, it's okay. Us older people, it's all right, say amen. I don't want them broke alongside the road. 
I think that they're automatic. But I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't matter to me if my kids live in a trailer or a mansion. I'm going to support them and love them and care about them. I'm going to go see them. Amen. Say, what are you going to do? I'm going to plop right in that single wide, double wide or mansion. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to see my kids and play with my kids. You say, why? Because those things are not that important then if that be the case, maybe you and I should stop living as if those things are the most important things that we can ever leave in the lives of our children. Fellas, it's our responsibility. It's my responsibility. Well, I've got a godly wife and she takes care of that. Thank God for that. Hey, but listen, how much more of an opportunity would your children have if they could have a godly mama and a godly daddy? How much more help would that lady have if she didn't have to fight and argue with get her kids to the house of God because their, their excuse is, well, Dad don't go. You ought to read your Bible. Dad don't read his Bible. You ought to pray. Dad don't pray. Shame on us. Oh, but we say we love Jesus and we're going to heaven, but not enough to motivate us to action. Let me tell you something. That the Father's responsibility. Dad, you're the head of that home. Number two, Dad, this, this Dad had a familiarity with the lamb. Can I tell you that one more time? This dad had a familiarity with the lamb. You see, this lamb, dad, had more than likely, now they had servants, they had people, but no doubt, no doubt it was dad or dad's money that bought it. It was probably dad or dad's servants that raised it. It was probably dad that went down, listen to me, and inspected it. Now you say, what are you talking about inspection? Remember this lamb had to be without spot or without blemish. Dad's responsibility over his home was to make sure that he offered a lamb without blemish and without spot. I don't know that dad, that so much was riding upon that responsibility that dad was going to trust anybody else besides him. You know, there's some things, there's some things that we do ignorantly, we trust everything. Anybody ever ride a ride at the fair? Come on, raise your hand. You ever, you ever rode a ride at the fair? Anybody ever looked at the people that inspect those rides? Man, you'll jump on them. What's it going to do? It's going to spin me around and around and around, flip, 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 and it's going to stop. He put it together with a Dewalt drill that he found in a, in a, in a, a, a pawn shop somewhere. How's it look? Looks good to me. Now listen, I'm not making fun of people, but you know, we're not talking about, you know, carowinds. And if they can haul it on a trailer... Down the highway at 70. And you just going to put your kids on it. <laughs> Ride, go have fun, we're going to eat. We're crazy. But when you talk about something as important as their soul, you better yourself have a familiarity with the Lamb. Because I'm going to tell you, it's going to be hard for me to confidently speak to my children about the Lamb if I'm not familiar with the Lamb. See, the Bible said the lamb was without blemish and without spot. Dad was familiar with the lamb. We need, some, we need some dads in our families who's familiar with the lamb. We need some dads who know what it's like to put their faith and trust in the lamb. We, know some, we need some dads and some fathers in our, in our household. Hey, listen, that Jesus is not foreign when it comes to them. The teaching of Jesus, the preaching of Jesus, the words of Jesus. We need some dads who are familiar with the lamb. You say, preacher, I'm saved, but I don't know him very well. Get to know him, dads. We need to be familiar with the lamb. How are we going to lead our children to what the lamb says if we don't ourselves know what the lamb says? How am I going to point in a direction? Jesus said this, Jesus did that. I'm afraid so many times we leave our children's spiritual education much the way we leave our children's social education or their public education. We just hope that somebody will teach them. I'm going to tell you, that's not a good philosophy when it comes to their education at the schoolhouse. You need to be involved in those things. Because I can promise you what they're teaching was not what you agree with in, in all counts and in all sorts. I can promise you what they define as science is not science. I can promise you what they call science is not science. I can promise you what they refer to as creation and authority is not the way God laid it out. You better get involved in those things. But wait a minute, from a spiritual matter, you realize that it's not the preacher's job to raise your children spiritually. Thank God for some godly Sunday school teachers who will teach your children and pray over your children and study the scriptures to prepare a lesson for your children. But listen, we only have them for an hour a week. One hour a week. Whose responsibility is it, Dad? It's yours. It's yours. 
Man, the responsibility of the father. By the way, you say, preacher, I don't know what a difference a dad really makes. I mean, does it really matter if I get involved? Hey, won't you ask the dads of Israel versus the dads of Egypt? You see, there were some dads in Israel who decided, I'm going to take God on his word. There's some dads in Egypt said, I better get familiar with the lamp. There were some dads in Egypt said, I believe God means business. But those dads in, e- in Egypt, rather, those dads in Egypt just said, eh, we don't believe our God anyway. Nothing happened. You're going to find out that they lost their firstborn that night. You're going to find out they lost their firstborn. Why? Because they shirked their responsibility. Number one, the responsibility of the dad. Number two, look at the burden of a dad. Can I tell you this? I believe, I believe that any dad that's weight, uh, worth his weight and salt will be concerned about the soul of his children. I believe that any dad that genuinely loves his children will be concerned about their soul. Now I'll say this. I understand, you understand that every child has to make their own choice. Your children are not saved because you're saved. Children are not going to heaven because you are. They're going to have to make their own decision. They're going to have to choose to be familiar with the Lamb. But I'm going to tell you, I believe the burden of a father is that his children know Christ as their Savior. And, the bur- and, and they're concerned about not only their salvation, but they're concerned about their life in which they live. I believe these dads here in Israel, I believe they were burdened, Brother Darrell. I really do. I believe they were burdened. Now, first of all, because they were burdened, I believe that they thought it important to give attention to detail. God laid out very specific details as to how to prepare their household, didn't He? Get a lamb without blemish and without spot. Step number one, get a lamb without blemish and without spot. Then He he described to them the meal. Then He described to them how they were to partake of the meal. Then He described to them how they were to dispose of what was left over the meal. You say, why would God do that? Because it was important. Then He told them about the sacrifice. Then he told them about the sprinkling of the blood. He told them about the hyssop. He told them about all. He gave them every detail. Can I tell you, God's given us details as to how to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Too many times we want to pick and piece and we want to just kind of take all the details. Well, I'll do a little of this, but, you know, I don't think that's that big a deal. And I'll do a little of this, but that. No, no, we better give attention to detail, fathers, because it's our responsibility. You see, he was so burdened. He was so concerned. I believe this. I believe the reality of what was at stake set in his mind. We would do well as dads if we we would be reminded of the reality of what's at stake. The reality of what's at stake. Maybe this dad wasn't one of the firstborn, but he had firstborn. Now I know it applies to more, it, it applies to their cattle, it applied to everything, but I don't believe that a dad loved his cattle as much as he loved his kids. And I believe the reality of what was at stake set in. And so he gave attention to detail. What about dad's care for his children? I I just want you to think about something for a minute. You ever think about what it must have been like for dad this night? You ever think about what it must have been like for him? We think about what it was like for that child, but you ever think much about what it was like for dad that night? Back in chapter number 11, and I I may be getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I'm going to give you this. Back in chapter number 11, the Bible tells us in verse number 4, And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of the land. About midnight will I go out into the midst of the land. That's dark, right? That's at night. What's usually going on at midnight? Sleeping. You reckon reckon this dad has ever come by? How many have ever done this? How many have ever checked on your kids when they're sick? Walked in, you don't, you don't want to wake them up because they just got to sleep. They felt miserable and if they can just, they need some rest. But man, you was concerned about them. And you walk back to that bedroom and you make sure you're quiet and you kind of maybe even lift up on that door a little bit so it don't squeak. Y'all don't live in an old house, you might not know what that's like. But you ease that door open and you just peek in. Any parent know what you do? You look for those blankets going up and down, don't you? Don't you? You know why you do that, man? Because you're so concerned because you love that youngin' so much. And you want to make sure they're okay. You reckon about you reckon about 11.45, this dad, he couldn't sleep. He leans over and he tells his wife, said, I'll be back in just a minute. She probably knew where he was going. Mama probably already been there. Mama might have been laying outside the door. 
But he just goes in and maybe he pushes that curtain back or however it was. And, and he just looks in about 11.45 and he begins to pray. Oh God, take care of my boy. God, I, I'm, this is out of my control. God, I, I've, done, I've, done what, I've, got, I've done what you told me, but God, please take care. About 11, about 11.50, he goes back in. He just can't stand it and he looks. Boy's still sleeping. About 11, about 11.58, he goes in there. And he says, okay, I'm just going to trust the Lord. But about 12.15, I can't hardly believe, brother, Darryl, maybe that dad just kind of crept in and pulled the curtain back. Almost, I, I believe God, but what if? And he pulled that curtain back, and that boy's... I'm telling you, I believe that dad was burdened that night. I believe that dad was burdened. I, oh, I believe he loved God. I believe he believed the man of God. I believe all those things. But I believe he was burdened. God, that's, that's my boy. God, that's my girl. God, that's my, that's my firstborn. Man, the burden of a father. The burden of a father. Spiritual leaders of the home, I believe, will be burdened for their children. It's not because they doubt God. But they, they, but they desire their children to be saved and secure. It's not that we're doubting God. We're burdened for them. God, I know that you can't. God, I'm burdened for my children. Then obedience to God's way. Look down at verse 27. I, I'm just about done. Stay with me. Verse 27, the Bible said, the latter part of that verse said, and the people bowed the head, back in verse, chapter number 12. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away, look at this, and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. Obedience to God's way. Now I believe that obedience is going to lead into something. I believe that your burden, church, dads, can develop into confidence. Because not only do you see the responsibility of a dad and the burden of a dad, but I believe also in this, in this passage of Scripture we can find the confidence of a dad. The confidence of a dad. Listen, while the dad may have had some fears, his fears could be overcome. Can you imagine? Dad probably wasn't the only one that was worried, was he? <laughs> How'd you like to have been that firstborn? Whoa, whoa, dad set the family down and said, listen, here's what God said. We're getting ready to get out of Egypt. Here's how God's going to do it. Can you say that again? He's going to do what? Through the whole land of Egypt. Hey, dad, we live in Egypt. Uh, dad, um, I'm the firstborn. You mean to tell me that if we do this, everything's going to be okay? Yes, sir. Can you imagine the night before? Maybe that boy's sitting over there. Maybe he hears him sniffle. Maybe, maybe, maybe the boy can't sleep. Maybe the dad sets up with him through the night. I don't know. I don't know. Every, every individual's different, but regardless of the fact, here's, here's a young man. And he had to tell his son in this talk before bedtime, Son, you need to go to sleep. Because you know what he's going to tell him. He's going to tell him just like we as parents do. Oh, you can trust the Lord. How many times have you ever told your kids that? You can trust the Lord. It just rolls off our tongue like it's easy. Until it's you in a situation where your kids want to come back and say, you can trust the Lord. But I believe he said, son, you just got to trust the Lord. This is what the Lord said to do. We've done what the Lord said to do. You're going to have to trust the Lord. Well, how, Dad, do you know that it's going to be okay? So how can we tell our kids today, I know it's going to be okay? Well, I believe the first thing you find is the preciousness of the Lamb. How can I tell my kids in a changing world that everything's going to be okay in the end? Let me tell you why. Because of the preciousness of the Lamb. How can I tell my children in a world, in a society that's turned their back on the living God? How can I tell them you can know for a fact that it's going to be okay with you? Let me tell you why. It's not because of their good works. It's not because of what they did. It's not because of how they behaved. It's all because of the preciousness of the Lamb. The preciousness of the Lamb. At this very moment in history, at this very moment in the, in the history of the nation of Israel, <clears throat> everything is dependent on one thing, and it's on the Lamb. Everything. The unity and the safety of that family is dependent wholly 
upon the lamb and what they've done with it. The very life of that firstborn was dependent wholly and entirely upon that lamb. Let me tell you something, dads, moms. The security of your children, the security of my children, is not dependent upon me, but it's dependent upon entirely upon the Lamb. So I better make sure that I'm familiar with the Lamb myself and that I introduce them to that Lamb. That Lamb was the most important thing in that house. Everything was dependent... First Peter teaches us that he, talking about Jesus, is precious. You know, the Song of Solomon teaches us that Jesus is the fairest of 10,000. I begin to think about that one lamb. They probably had a lot of lambs, didn't they? They probably had a lot of sheep. But there was only one that was spotted. Let me tell you something. This world has a lot to offer our young people, but there's only one lamb. This world has a lot that they're saying, do this, it makes life better. Try this, live like this, think like this. But can I tell you something this morning? You say there's only one lamb. John the Baptist said, behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the lamb. There's only one lamb. This lamb was the most important thing. Hey, he was a specific lamb. Verse, chapter 12, verse number 5. Uh, he was to be spotless and without blemish. Uh, without blemish, He was a prepared and partaken of lamb. In verses 6 through 11. Hey, verse number twelve, uh, verse number 7 of chapter number 12. Thanks be unto the Lord. He's an applied lamb. If the lamb's ever going to benefit you, he must be applied. That blood had to be applied. You see, it wasn't enough just for the lamb's blood to be shed. But the blood had to be applied to the doors. Blood had to be applied. Let me tell you something. Jesus died for the sins of mankind. But the blood must be applied. The blood must be applied. He's a protecting lamb. Boy, I like that. Verse number 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You realize as God's people, we don't have to live in fear of the judgment of God. We've been told we've not been appointed under wrath. You say, what is it? I've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, redeemed with that precious blood. I've been redeemed. Your children can be saved. He's a protecting lamb. You say, why did Dad have confidence? I believe he had confidence because of the precious of the lamb, but because of the promise of the Lord. He said, when I see the blood, I'm going to pass over you. Oh, when I, we sing that song, don't we? When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. What is that? That is a promise from God in heaven. You realize that the all-eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing God told the Israelites that if you'll apply the blood of the Lamb, and the plague won't touch you, the death angel will pass over you. And as he went from house to house, please, you say, preacher, can we really raise a godly family in days this way? Oh, yes, you can. But the lamb is imperative. The lamb is imperative. I can promise you this. There was nothing in that house on that day more important than that lamb. Nothing. They might have forgot a lot of things. They might have forgot their, their favorite coat. They might have forgot their favorite shoes. They might have forgot anything else. But I can tell you what they did not forget. They did not forget the lamb. Let me tell you something. You can provide a lot of things, but you better not forget the lamb. By the way, I don't believe the lamb was on the back burner on that day. Oh, yes. You see too many homes today. Oh, so preacher, we haven't forgot the lamb. No, but you put him way back here on the back burner. Oh, you put, oh, we've got entertainment and fun and, and this and this and this, but we've forgotten the lamb. Let me, let me say it this way. We've deprioritized the lamb. You know what's happened in our country? We still walk around and say we're a Christian nation, but we've deprioritized the lamb. You've heard it said. You've heard it said. If the church had been essential, the church would still be deemed as essential. We have made the church unessential. Hit, miss, in and out, up and down. Don't teach your children. Don't. You say, what are you talking about? I'm telling you, we have deprioritized the lamb in our life. We don't want to leave him out because we don't want to go to hell. But we've deprioritized the lamb. 
I believe on this night the lamb was the most important thing. Everything pivoted upon that lamb. Maybe we should get back to that. Hey, he was precious to a dad that was responsible. That lamb was precious to a mom that was concerned. That lamb was precious to a child that was fearful. That lamb was precious to siblings who may have been skeptical. That lamb was precious to a society that was hopeful. Do you realize that whole country wanted out of Egypt? That whole society. And they were hopeful that... How many times had the other plagues seemingly failed? Hadn't failed was preparing their hearts. But in their eyes, that didn't work. That didn't work. That didn't work. Pharaoh went back with his word. That didn't work. You know what they were doing? You know, I believe this. I believe they're saying, well, I hope this works. God had already said, after this happens, not only is he going to let you go, he's going to throw you out. God, I want this to work. Oh, God, I'm hopeful that it's worked. Looking for that blessed hope. And that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I'm going to say, what's a society need? A society needs to see Him as precious to a society that's hopeful. This event was necessary for their deliverance from the bondage of Egypt. Without the Lamb, they couldn't be set free. Listen to me today. What our society needs to hear is the event of Calvary is necessary if we're to ever be set free. It's necessary. And the application of the blood is necessary if we're to ever be set free. I'll give you this and I'm done. Preacher, I don't have a dad. But preacher, I don't have a godly dad. And there's, there's kids all over this all over this world. Some of them don't even know who, who their dad is, where their dad is, never seen him, never met him, dad's not been involved. Some of them said, I got a dad, but preacher, he don't, he don't raise me for, for God. He, he don't care about the Lord. He don't care about the Lord, preacher. What, what about me? You, you, preacher, what about me? As, have I just been forsaken, preacher? Do I not matter? What about me? Oh, let me tell you something. The Bible uses a specific term, and I want you to listen to it closely. Some of you know where I'm going. But in Romans chapter number 8, in verse number 15, the Bible says this, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Abba is a term that means Papa. It's a very personal term. It's a very, much like y'all have heard, heard my daughter. My daughter don't call me Daddy. She calls me Diddy. She's always done it. And I know when I hear that, I know Cassie's here. Cassie's somewhere. It, it, is, a, it is a term that, it, that is personal. My, my boys call me Dad. Dad, Dad, what about this? Dad. What about that? Dad, check this out. Dad, look at this. It is a personal term. My boys don't come to me and say, Father, may I speak with you, Father? Now, Caleb probably will this afternoon because I said that. <laughs> Call me Dad. It's a personal. It's, it's almost a casual, comfortable word. Well, aren't you glad? Hey, listen, that there's a God in heaven who is the Father of all, but we can know so intimately that we are comfortable going and crying to have a Father. You say, well, preacher, how, how personal is it? Well, let me give you this. The Bible tells us of a man by the name of Jesus, the Son of God. The Bible just tells us in Romans 8, 15 that He has sent forth the Spirit of His Son in this world whereby we cry, Abba, Father. But in Mark, chapter number 14, Jesus addresses His heavenly Father. Listen to the words of Jesus. And he said, now he's in the garden praying before Calvary. And he said, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Do you realize that if we're here this morning, we can call God the same way that His very Son, Jesus Christ, can call Him? We can have the same relationship with God that Jesus has with Him. I'm telling you, listen, it doesn't matter if you have an earthly father that loves God, there's a God in heaven who will be your Abba Father, personal, on a, on a relationship basis that you can talk with and share with and care with. Can I tell you, a God that's burdened about you so much so that He sent His only Son to take your place take my place. Say, preacher, it's not fair. It might not be fair, but I want you to keep your eyes not on down here, but get your eyes on a God in heaven that sent His Son for you. For you. For me. You see, that lamb that was sacrificed, that lamb didn't do anything wrong. 
It's just a lamb. You think about preacher, a sacrifice is cruel. It is for the lamb, but it's merciful to those in whom the blood of the lamb covers. Boy, Calvary was a cruel place. The penalty of sin is a cruel penalty. But the sacrifice of Jesus was mercy on behalf of God. Who loved us, the Bible says of Jesus, and gave himself for us. But wait a minute. For God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, the Bible says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations, received by traditions from your fathers, but with the, here's that word again, precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Well, I want to challenge us today as dads and would-be dads. We must fulfill our responsibilities to our families as spiritual leaders. We've got to be familiar with the Lamb ourselves. We have got to keep our children familiar with the Lamb. Keep Jesus as the focal point. Keep Christ as the center of your home. It's our responsibility, and it's time that we wake up and do that. We must never lose our burden for a condition of our children. Never. By the way, I don't know that that ever goes away, does it? And you want your children to walk with God, love God, serve God. Now you pray differently. Start out praying that your kids will get saved. Then your kids get born again. Then you start praying, Lord, would you help them to serve? God, would you help them to serve you with their life? Maybe your kids get astray. God, would you bring my children back? God, would you deal with their heart? You say, why is that? Because you're burdened. You're a parent. You're burdened. Don't lose your burden. Don't lose your burden. Pray. Seek God over your children. We've got to focus our confidence in the preciousness of the Lamb, the promise of the Lord. We live in uncertain times. I'm, I'm fearful for what my kids and my grandkids have to live in. You know, we say this, they'll never know the country that I grew up in. They'll never know the America that I grew up in. I believe it's forever changed. But they can know the God that I grew up knowing because I lived in America. They can know Him. They can walk with Him. Don't lose sight of our confidence in our Heavenly Father. We got to keep telling the story of the compassion of the Father. You know, you notice in this portion of Scripture what Israel is supposed to do every year. They establish the feast every year. You know why they did that as a constant, continual reminder of the Passover, the day that He saw the blood and passed over them. Listen, don't ever quit telling the story. Don't ever quit sharing the gospel. Don't ever allow the Lamb to take a back seat. In your priorities, in your practice, in your focus, always keep the lamb before your family. Man, what a difference a dad can make. Those dads in Egypt, in, in Egypt and those dads in Israel, you see a drastic difference. But what a difference the dads in Israel made in the lives of those firstborn. Dads, you and I have an opportunity to make a difference. Let's be the kind of dads that God wants us to be. Would you stand with me this morning?